Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, starting in chapter 9, verse 9. And Jesus continued on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at a kiosk for collecting taxes. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed. As Jesus sat down to eat in Matthew's home, many tax collectors and sinners joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. Go and learn what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. I didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners. At that time, John's disciples came and asked Jesus, Why do we and the Pharisees frequently fast, but your disciples never fast? Jesus responded, The wedding guests can't mourn while the groom is still with them, can they? But the days will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they'll fast. No one sews a piece of new unshrunk cloth on old clothes because the patch tears away the cloth and makes a worse tear. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. If they did, the wineskins would burst, the wine would spill, and the wineskins would be ruined. Instead, people pour new wine into new wineskins so that both are kept safe. While Jesus was speaking to them, a ruler came and knelt in front of him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and place your hand on her and she'll live. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Then a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his clothes. She thought, If only I touch his robe, I'll be healed. When Jesus turned and saw her, he said, Be encouraged, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that time on. When Jesus went into the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the distressed crowd. He said, Go away, because the little girl isn't dead, but is asleep. But they laughed at him. After he had sent the crowd away, Jesus went in and touched her hand, and the little girl rose up. And news about this spread throughout the whole region. Here ends the reading of the word of God for the people of God. Okay. You may have seen the sermon title and wondered why it is called a bucket, box, or bag. Or it's because I have a bucket, a box, and a bag with me. Of course. All right, so I have three things. I know you're, this is going to become your favorite party game after this. These are three things I actually use. Well, the bag's not going to stand up. We'll lay it there. Okay. Um, so I don't have any, I don't have shelves in my desk. In my office, it's just a flat surface. And so I needed something to uh, carry, you know, the various odds and ends that I have, you know, extra pens or papers or just, you know, various things that I, don't know. I needed close by, but, you know, I didn't have a shelf. I didn't have anything to put them in. So I needed to get something. So of these three, which one do you think I got to put stuff in? The bag? Oh, no. We have some people that think outside the box. Yes, the box. Yes, the box. It makes sense. All right, how about go grocery shopping? Not the bucket? You could. You could. It would work. It might be a little inconvenient if you're picking up more than a few things and you had to carry around several of them. Uh, the last one, uh, not to give it away, but I, I use it to wash my car. Uh, I have to put soap and water in it. It needs to, needs to be able to hold it. The bag. It's not a waterproof bag. Yeah, the bucket. So, you know, it's, it's silly and it's simplistic, but I, essentially I have three tools here. Three tools, and which one I pick is determined by the task. Which one I pick is determined by the task. And we do, the right tools make the task a lot easier in life. And so, you know, I'm the picture hanger-upper in the house. Um, and depending on how many pictures are up there, it just depends on what tools that I need. So if it's just one picture and it doesn't have to be that precise, I can get away with just a hammer and a nail. If it's a heavier picture, if there's multiple ones, if they have to be even or in some kind of design or something, I, I, gotta get, I have to have more tools. I could maybe get away with just a hammer and a nail, but there's going to be some extra holes in the wall. Um, it's going to take a little bit more time, and there's going to be a few more mistakes, but you know, if I have to be more precise, I, I get out the ruler, or I have a laser level, or I have another level. Um, sometimes I even get a piece of paper out if I have to really, 
there's one wall that has nine pictures that are supposed to be in a certain spot, so I had to really like diagram it out. Um, the tools make the task possible. And so we, we understand when it's you know, simple things like this that we need to use the right tools to accomplish the task. Now, all of us have been given a set of tools. I mean, maybe it is like a physical toolbox that you have, but more than that, when it comes to uh, relationships and emotions, when it comes to spirituality, congregations, when it comes to ministry, you've been given a set of tools. Now, you may not know that you have, but you have been. And this is just really the ways that you do things. You, you've inherited it. So when it comes to relationships, dealing with conflict, communicating, when it comes to church, you know, the, the ministries that we have and the ways that we do ministries, the times of the services, the styles of the services, dealing with your own emotional stress. Like we have these tools that have been given to us or, or we've taken on, and this is how we move through life. But sometimes the task doesn't fit the tool. And we get stuck because we have these tools and we're trying to go grocery shopping and all we have is a bucket. And if we can get by if it's just maybe a few things, but if we have to go shopping for the whole family, we don't really want to carry 10 buckets around with us walking around Publix. And so Jesus, as we go into this passage today, I think he speaks to this in the relationship between tasks and tools and that we always need to be ready to use whatever tool is needed to accomplish the task. So in our passage, Jesus is fully in ministry mode. Uh, essentially, what he does in ministry mode is he, he's traveling around. So he goes from you know, city to city, and as he goes along, he teaches. You think of a lot of the parables of Jesus. So he teaches to large crowds, small crowds, um, and he also he heals people. Um, so there's people that are sick, and so he, he's healing people. And he just, essentially, that's what a lot of his ministry was, traveling around, preaching, and healing people. Now, as he did this, and as he encountered lots of different people, uh, we just have just a, a little snapshot, but if you backed out even a couple chapters in Matthew, there's a whole range of different types of people that he meets. You imagine that the same tool wouldn't work for every single person that Jesus instead decided on the tool based upon the task. Now, everybody loves change. They always love when people do things that are different. Um, and so people had a couple of questions that they asked Jesus as he went along because he was gaining some steam, he was pretty popular, and he was doing things that were different uh, than what the norm was. And so just a, a couple questions. One, he was asked, why does Jesus, why, why does he eat with sinners? Now, in that culture, eating was more than eating. Um, you know, a lot of times we, you know, you may just run by a restaurant or something, you just have to pick something up. Uh, you know, you just sit around the table. It, but a lot of times for us, eating, it can be, you know, maybe building friendships. But for them, eating was a little more. One thing is it helped maintain social structures. And so you ate with people at your own level for the most part. And that kind of, you know, that kept social structures in place from those that were on the on the bottom, which we would say is the the sinners and tax collectors in this, um, to those that were the upper echelons, uh, maybe like the Pharisees, those that were the really religiously pious, and so it, it maintained it on who you ate with. Also, uh, group identity was built around meals. When the early Christians, um, they didn't do what we do, they didn't like gather around in a large group like this one. They didn't have facilities to be able to do that. Uh, they gathered around a dinner table, and they had a meal together, and they formed group identity through a lot of, you know, rituals and practices that they would have. So that every time that they gathered, they would do something. They would have communion, this kind of ritual that helped form their group identity. So eating is more than eating. It's, it's accepting people in. It's bringing them into the fellowship. And so Jesus is a rabbi, and the religious people, the pious religious people, uh, don't understand why is he doing this, because for them to connect with God, you did that through purity. Purity, by, uh, by living a certain way, by you know, not doing certain things, doing certain things, lots of rules and regulations, and that's how you connect with God. Jesus is not doing that. He's going and he's eating with the people that were 
unclean, the people that would not be allowed in worship because they weren't ritually pure. And so those are the, the sinners. And so sinners were essentially people that uh, either they habitually behaved in a way that was seen as immoral or they, you know, they contradicted some widely shared religious observance. And tax collectors found, were, fell into that. And so it's, you know, a lot of people are going to be getting their W-2s in the next few days. And so um, if you're like me, I always owe money. And so I go in and I figure out how much I need to owe. Uh, and they you say, okay, you owe $1,000, but you got to pay $2,000 today because the tax collector would make their money off how much they could extort from you. Now, I didn't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily have had the option of just shopping around and going to somebody else. And so you were a large part, you were at the mercy of the tax collector. You just had to do whatever they paid, whatever they wanted to pay, and that's how they made their money, and they made a lot of money from that as well. And this was a particularly poor area, not a really affluent area, and so they, you have a bunch of people that really don't like the tax collector. You know, I don't know a ton of people that are fans of the IRS, but you really don't like, sorry if you work for the IRS, but really don't like the tax collectors, and in large part, they were Jewish people who kind of felt like they sold out, and they went to work for the Roman government that was kind of occupying the land, and so these are people that are, you know, they don't come, they don't come to church, they don't come to worship, they're excluded from it, but Jesus had a task, and his task was not to maintain the tools. His task was to be with the people who were hurting, to be with the people who were excluded, to be with, as he says, the sick. The doctor, you know, people go to a doctor that are sick, not the healthy. And so he, his job, he saw his duty was to go to those who were on the margins, those who were in need, those that were broken. And so because that was his task, he just adopted the tool that was necessary to do that. And so what was that? Eating with them, offering hospitality, offering relationship, offering a second chance, offering kindness and goodness instead of excluding them. And so he just adopts the tool that is needed for the task. Well, it goes on, and John's disciples, so John the Baptist is kind of like the opening act for Jesus. He kind of prepared the way, and so he had his own disciples, and so disciples are like apprentices. Um, they're, they're wanting to, you know, become like the, the rabbi, the person that they're following. And they had a particular way of doing religious life. Uh, you know, they prayed in a certain way. You know, they had certain rituals. And one of them was fasting. And fasting was just abstaining from eating food for, for particular times. Um, it was something that they did, something that the, you know, religious people did in the area. And then they see Jesus, and he seems to be partying all the time and eating with people. And your disciples never fast. Why is that? It's largely the same answer. That's not what's needed right now. You know, if you, if you were invited, you know, you don't, you don't mourn or you don't, you know, if you were invited to someone's house for dinner and you didn't eat, like that, that would be rude. You know, this is, a, this is a joyous time. My disciples are like, they're with me. The main act is here. And that, you know, if you're going to eat with sinners and tax collectors, you actually have to eat food. And so, it's just, it doesn't fit. This is not what fits right now. This is not the tool for the task at hand. Now, there'll come a day, he says, when they'll fast. Fasting is not bad. Tools are not bad in and of themselves. But it's when they're applied, which one is beneficial to accomplish the task. And so, it's just, it's just not what it is right now. This is not what they need. And so I see in Jesus' ministry, and there's multiple examples. You could go on to the woman who had the issue of bleeding, who would have been excluded from worship, and women in that culture were uh, second-class human beings, and so would have been excluded from worship, would have been second-class, and, you know, Jesus offers words of kindness to her, which was probably frowned upon. And so Jesus' mission was to go to those that were broken, those who were hurting, hurting, those that needed reconciliation, and offer that, offer healing and wholeness, and he just adopted whatever tools were needed. If it was the disciples and they, they needed training, 
And what did he do? He adopted the tools. He took them with him. He, he, he poured into them. He corrected them. He just used the tools that were needed to accomplish the task. And so when it comes to relationships, when it comes to your job, when it comes to the church, our job is never to maintain the tools. It's always to adopt the tool that is needed for the task. Now, this sounds great in theory, but is near impossible to do. Because, how many of you, anybody think that you're a rational person? You're not. From psychology to brain analysis, it, is that we, from sociology, we are not rational creatures. You are not wired to be rational, you are wired to be relational. And so we form our beliefs and our values largely based upon who we see as our group. When you understand that the world is not rational and people aren't rational, politics makes perfect sense. Because it's not based on rationality. It's based upon the group that you see yourself a part of. And when we do that, being a part of the group is important. We want to know our place. We want to be in. We want to be around people. We want to know that we're not excluded. And so when somebody comes along and they offer a different tool, whether it be a different way of understanding or a different way of doing, our natural response is always to discount it, discredit it, turn, turn away. It's always our natural response, myself included. I'm not, I, I'm not exempt from this. And so we are not wired to be able to do this. We, it's we always take the path of least resistance. And so when it comes to people actually offering changes or saying, hey, why don't we try this or why don't we do this, we don't like it. I was uh, pastoring at a church and there was a, a water line that broke to a bathroom. Um, caused about a, a, I don't know, $120,000 $120, in damage in the sanctuary. Um, just a little supply line on a toilet. And so like you had to get all the carpet replaced. Uh, we had pews in there, and they were um, not solid wood pews, and so it was press board, uh, particle board, and they, they got wet. It just, it's kind of done from that point on. And so lots of stuff, lots of remodeling to do. Now, I found out pews are really expensive. It would have been eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 of that money just to replace the pews, or $20,000 to get chairs rationally, you think, yes, of course chairs make sense. A lot of people had trouble with that because the pew was the tool that they had used to sit on for their spiritual growth for however many years. That's just what it meant to be church. And that's not bad. It's not good. It just is. That's just the tool that they were used to. Even though somebody on the other part could say, well, okay, like money-wise, like you're not even going to be able to put new carpet in unless you like, do this unless you do the chairs. We're not rational creatures. I think how we go about making this transition to using the tool that is necessary um, is really going down to a fundamental level, something that I think only Jesus can do, that the Holy Spirit can do, is remember what is at the core of ministry. What is at the core of what we are called to do, who we are called to be? Something that we are reminded of in baptism. Now, baptism is all about identity. I say we form our understanding and our values through who we identify with, our groups. And baptism is all about identity. It says in baptism, at your core, that God has accepted and loved you. That you are, you are a part of the family of God. That's your primary social group, that you are a part of the family of God. And there's a baptismal promise that is given. It says, The Holy Spirit will work within you, that being born through water in the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. That the Holy Spirit that God, through the Holy Spirit, will do everything that is necessary so that you can be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. I believe in baptism, God gives us the grace to be able to go to that more fundamental level, that level I believe Jesus operated at, where he understood my task is not to make everybody happy. It is not to cater to the ways that things are already always done, but 
to bring healing to those that are broken, to bring reconciliation into the world. And I need to do whatever is necessary. At the end of the day, he was the ultimate tool, and he gave what was necessary, giving his, giving his life so that healing and wholeness could come into the world. And so if we, as a, as a church, want to continue spreading the faith from generation to generation, there's going to be a lot of tools out there that we have never used before. There's a lot of people that will, are not even close to ever setting foot in a space of worship. It might, I would, for somebody that has had a very traumatic faith experience or has never been or suspicious of faith, I'm estimating a minimum of two years in relationship before they would even consider it. I mean, there's, and so the church oftentimes operates that, well, this is our tools, and if we just keep using the same tools, well, something else will happen, and it won't. Now, does that mean the tools we have are bad? No. Absolutely not. I mean, you come to this service because you enjoy a certain type of environment, you enjoy a certain type of music, a certain style that's different from the service that I'm about to do at 11 o'clock. And I have been at a place where I prefer this type and I prefer the more traditional. It just depends. And in your spiritual life, you'll find that not, it doesn't always fit into the same tools. And so you may have done the same things, but they don't seem to get the same result, or it's a little different, and so it's, well, maybe I need to try a different tool. It's at this, baptism reminds us at this fundamental level that we are not here just to maintain the tools, but we are here, and the Spirit will empower us to be the body of Christ in the world, to be disciples of Jesus Christ, and that will take us to new places, and that will take us to old places. That will make us use new methods and new tools, and sometimes using old tools as well. It'll cause us to be comfortable and uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, if we are faithful, because we know God will be faithful in our baptismal vows, we will see a little bit of heaven come down to earth. We will see a little bit of brokenness be healed. We will see relationships that are divided come together, we will experience the healing ministry of Jesus. And that is the ministry that you are called into, church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.